Sure. Um, and I do want to uh, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, Boolean Vault Services. Um, the first thing I should note for, for everyone viewing is, you know, I am a Boolean Vault customer. I actually have a, at least for me, a significant amount of uh, capital with Boolean Vault. So you can interpret that as an endorsement or a bias or both. Um, I guess, you know, the reason, and Adrian touched on these uh, subjects, uh, the reason I, I like Boolean Vault is um, it's allocated gold, which means it's in my name. Um, you know, if you look closely at the ETFs, and obviously the futures contracts are even worse, it's it's not clear that you're the owner. You're more like a creditor. So if there's something wrong with the the, the organization that manages the fund uh, that you've purchased shares in, then that doesn't necessarily mean it's a little bit like an MF Global type uh, scenario. Whereas with allocated gold, it's in your name. So that's definitely. I mean, that's the critical thing is that allocated is that it is delivered. It's physically there in the vault, it's not going anywhere, and it isn't lent, leased, or used for anybody else's financing. Now, unallocated is interesting because if you think about what happened in the 80s and 90s, so gold's in a huge bear market, you know, it loses 80% of its real dollar value in 20 years. And at the same time, you have the financial services boom, you have deregulation on Wall Street, you have the big bang here in the city of London. And nobody's interested in gold because gold's in a bear market. You could get 5% real returns on cash in the bank. Who needed gold? Nobody, right? Um, and you obviously have the long bull market in equities and the long bull market in bonds at the same time. Nobody needed gold. So the only innovation that you had in the gold market really in that time was unallocated, which is where refineries who have inventory coming in all the time, and it comes in, it sits there, it gets refined into product and out it goes. They've got a constant flow of stock. Also the bullion banks, they've got a constant flow of stock because these are the guys who act as the kind of warehouses for material in the wholesale market as it comes through from the refinery and heads out. And these guys came up with the idea of saying, well, look, you know, how the hell are we going to make a buck on this business now? You know, no one's interested in gold. What are we going to do? How about we sell them gold that they don't own? Gee, that's a good idea. So we sell them the gold, but we keep control of it. We can still lease it and make a yield on it, having sold it to the customer. Okay, we best sweeten the deal. How should we sweeten the deal? Let's not charge him for storage. Well, that sounds fair enough because you don't own anything. Why would you pay for storage on something you don't even own? That's the critical thing with allocated versus unallocated. It's there and it's not going anywhere and it's not used for anything else other than the fact that you own it. So, and that's what Bullion Vault's always been about. Um, you know, making sure that your gold is not exposed to anybody else's solvency, not exposed to anybody else's credit risk. Sure. And, uh, you know, that's, I mean, like as I noted, that's definitely one of the things that I wanted. You know, I'm, I'm coming from, you know, a similar perspective that you're coming from in that I'm mainly, no, or now entirely, I did some speculating before, but now I'm entirely just, you know, buying and holding the gold and, you know, it's, you know, purchasing and adding more strategically when there's a dip and then waiting for either remonetization or what I will interpret or try to look like some type of a blow off uh, and exit at that point. But basically it's just a lot of sitting around and waiting. I think allocated makes a lot of sense in that regard. Something you had touched on earlier, I just want to uh, rewind over and, and mm -hmm. talk a little bit more uh, deeply about is the uh, the the auditing process because one one common in conversations I've had uh, about bullion vault on informed trades one common concern is that oh do these guys even really have it is it like I'm sending the money and then like they're over in a foreign country mm -hmm. so how you mentioned it gets audited um, what's the frequency that it's audited and who's who's doing the audit well let's roll this back a bit I mean just the critical thing with bullion vault is we're a very innovative business in terms of how you as a private individual can access wholesale pricing, wholesale bullion, wholesale storage. But we haven't innovated at all in custody. The custody, the actual security, the care of the gold and silver. We haven't innovated in the gold and silver. You know, I mean our backgrounds are not in the bullion markets. Okay? You know, it's not where we come from. Paul Sustain, his background is in financial settlement. So his previous business was software systems for big investment houses to deal onto the London Stock Exchange to have their settlement done. So he's, he's about settlement. He's about getting stuff settled, yours done. That's Paul's background as an IT specialist. My background, obviously, is in you know, more financial analysis, analysis and so on. What William Bolt does is we take the existing well-established procedures and protocols and systems of the wholesale market. We don't interfere with that. We 
that this stuff has been developed over 300 years. Centered in the London market, which is still the clearinghouse for gold and silver worldwide. Most gold and silver will pass through at some point. Um, and it'll certainly be dealt for London settlement, whether it turns up in Hong Kong with the premium or wherever. We don't innovate there. With regards to custody, we employ specialists. We employ independent, third-party, non-bank custody providers. Now, these guys are secure logistics controls in the main Brinks, Viamat. What these guys do is they look after high-value objects and they make sure they're very, very secure. And they specialize in that. So firstly, we employ an independent custodian. When you see the bar list on the vault, that is coming from an independent third-party company. So it's not our vault. We're not saying, oh, we've got some gold downstairs. So if you look at what we do is, you know, Viamat, there is their bar list. Brinks, there is their bar list. Okay, so if we were fraudulently putting up a bar list from Viamat, which for no gold, we wouldn't get away with it for very long. You know, they're a big international concern, same with Brinks, you know, a listed US equity. We wouldn't get away with it for very long. Over and above that control, we then have independent audits every year by another third party, and we use specialist assayers who go into the vault once a year because that's what's necessary just to make sure that everything is up to date and everything is correct. The way that it works is that we are relying on the wholesale professional market and the way that it works there because these are the guys who know what they're doing. So it's, it's about saying, look, you have independent verification from the vault operator. Once a year, we have independent audits done by specialist assayers. Uh, in terms of um, delivery, is that uh, is that an option? Let's say someone wants delivery, or what? Are, what are the terms by which someone? Right now, I know you can order. And another thing I like about Bullion Vault is that you can order really small grams at, or really small increments. One gram being the smallest increment, mm -hmm. um, and that like other places that offer that small of an increment, the markup mm -hmm. is rather significant. So I tell people, you know, this is. Probably the least expensive way, at least expensive way I found, of purchasing allocated gold in small increments. For a lot of people that may not have, you know, now a gold being even seventeen hundred dollars an ounce, even after a decline, it's still for a lot of people it's still a, a fairly significant sum. So here's a way you can get, you know, a smaller amount uh, out of a lower markup. But there is that concern of the delivery. So when I'm purchasing with um, bullion vault, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that let's say I bought one gram, is that do I own one gram of a like forty ounce bar, or, or what are the terms on delivery, and what am I actually? How does the ownership actually break down? Sure. Well, what Bullion Vault does is yes, you have one gram if you if that's what you buy. Right. You have to give in a large four hundred ounce good delivery twelve and a half kilo bar. Now the great thing with gold is one gram of fine gold is one gram of fine gold. Okay, you can liken this to let's say if you're a farmer in the Midwest, okay, and your grain, and harvest has come and you get all your grain. Well, what are you going to do with it? Well, you're actually going to put it in a grain elevator, okay, waiting for the middle middleman to then ship that on for you and, and make the sale and so on. So you're going to deliver your grain into the grain elevator. You don't expect to get the same grain back, right? What you've got is you've got grain inside the elevator and you own that; belongs to you. So that's, I think, an analogy you can draw is to say, well, of course, you know, you've got full value on that grain, and then when it's sold, you get full value for that, and it's yours. And, of course, you can take it back out if you wish. And it's exactly what you can do with bullion bulk. So effectively what you've done, the legal term is bailment, what you've effectively done is it would belong to you in our care. We've arranged the custody with the third party and the audits and so on, and the insurance is taken care of. It belongs to you, though. It's not ours to control. It's not on our balance sheet. If you look at our financial statements, you won't see any customer property because it's not ours. So it doesn't feature on our balance sheet. Um, so that means you're not exposed to our credit in any way, shape, or form. Similarly, we're not exposed to customers because we don't give you any credit. So Bullion Board is a very simple, secure business in itself. We're not exposed to our customers in any way. If you want to take that out, that's fine. You can do that. Now, down as little as one gram, unfortunately, you know, because it's just the costs are going to be so massive. This is the problem in the, in the retail bar market for one gram increments, is the cost of production and fabrication on getting you a one gram unit into your hand, into your palm, is going to be so enormous relative to the value of that gram. So this is the point with bullion vault, is that what you are is you're inside the wholesale market. And that's why, as you say, Simit, the cost of trading is so low. You're trading wholesale gold, which previously you had to trade in 400 ounce units, 
but now you can trade that in one gram okay and it's within that bar if you wish to take possession you can do that of course but you are then going to have to pay the cost of retail fabrication so you're now going to have to pay those costs which are associated with coins and smaller bars which on bullion board in the meantime you've sidestepped because you're going straight to the wholesale market most of the gold coins and bars, you know, where does the US Mint source its gold for producing eagles? We get them in large 400 ounce bars because these are the wholesale units that the world trade. Same with the Krugerrand, you know, same with Philharmonics. You know, this is the big unit which can move around the world and then goes back in the pot and come out the other end as small bars in Switzerland or whatever it might be, solar bars out in Asia. What you're doing is you're basically trading at that level because you're accessing that price, but of course if you want to take possession, then you're going to trigger those costs. So on bullion vault, yes, of course you can take possession of your material. It's going to cost you 2.5% if you take possession of a whole bar, 400 ounces, because we then do have extra lien costs we've got to cover. We've got to make sure in terms of money laundering, etc. You know, stuff that we all have to put up with today, and that's what we do on bullion vault. If you take possession of something below 400 ounces, then you pay an extra 5%, so you're now paying 75 on gold because we've also now got to go and pay to get you the retail coin or the small bars to the same fine weight. Um, in terms of, um, you know, another another issue is with, with me and my personal uh, portfolio, gold portfolio, I do have some gold in my physical possession. Um, however, I didn't want to have, you know, a ton or a, a huge amount, you know, just because <laughs> I'm not in the security business. Um, so, you know, if someone, if I got robbed, hopefully that doesn't happen. And sure, you can get, a, you know, insurance of, of that type. But I'm just not a security specialist. I felt a little more comfortable outsourcing that responsibility to someone I can trust who is, who knows that, that side of things very well. Um, so related to that, you know, w about issues like suppose there was a sophisticated break into a vault. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there any protection for customers there, or, or, or how would that work? Oh, of course. I mean, the gold and silver are fully insured. Now, in the professional bullion market, the way it works is that the vault operator is responsible for arranging that insurance. The reason being that they would report the loss to the police. You know, they're, they're the ones who are actually caring for this material, so they would report the loss. It's, uh, it's insured on, on, on bullion vault as it is with any other decent company which is looking after your property in independent vaults. It's going to make sure that that cover is in place. Um, how is that then paid out? Well, obviously again, through Bullion Vault, we would then facilitate making sure that the full value to the customer was paid back. I believe, if I understand correctly, the way insurance would be triggered on this would be at the value of the next day's 3 p.m. London fix following discovery. Um, I believe that's standard in the industry. Um, but cover is, you know, it is very standardized across. Uh, Marsh are responsible for having the insurance for VMAT, whom we use. Um, you know, all the big insurance companies are, will have relationships within that market for covering, you know, wholesale bullion. Bottom line is, if you look at what our storage charge is, with insurance included, now, for our, for our customers who have got more than 40,000 US dollars, they're paying 12 basis points per year on gold. One basis point 0.01% per month, which is vanishingly small and is significantly lower than you would pay with a private bank to do allocated gold, probably about one tenth of the cost. Significantly lower than you will pay for household insurance on physical bullion. Um, and what? One third of the cost of the ETFs. Now, the reason that we can do it at that at that cost, and the reason that the industry can make it available to us at that cost to share with customers, is because the risk is judged to be so very small. You know, I mean, these sites are specialist bullion bosses. What they do. Um, so in terms of security, I mean, customers sometimes say, well, or prospective customers often ask, can I go and visit the gold? To which I'm afraid the answer is no, because you'll probably be arrested and most likely at gunpoint. You know, I mean, these vaults take security very, very seriously. Um, it is all they're there to do is to look after customer property. So they typically, these professional vaults typically are near airports. That's because these guys are in the secure logistics business, so they're moving stuff around the world. Um, but also so that they can call an armed response. Um, in terms of, you know, I noticed uh, you offer or 
part of the the service available to Bullion Vault customers is you can have you guys have vaults you know in a number of locations: Switzerland, London, New York. Um, why? What, what? Why? What's the what's the value of, of having a gold in a vault in London versus Switzerland? Well, I mean, the aim when Paul was developing the business was those are three major centers for bullion trading worldwide. So it just made sense to, you know, what Bullion Vault really does is it gets you as the private individual, the retail investor, as the industry likes to call you, into the whole market and give you the same kind of cost, cost savings and the same kind of security and the same kind of flexibility and control that a wholesale trader would have. So offering London, New York and Zurich means that, that you're in those markets effectively. Um, another big reason is giving all customers, because we have a choice of locations, all customers can own physical property overseas outside their home jurisdiction. Um, a lot of people look for diversification when they buy gold diversification of correlations and so on with other asset classes. I think geographic diversification makes sense. When you can do it at such a low cost, why have it not? One point to bear in mind is often um, you know, when things get really bad, look at history, take the, you know, the Bolshevik Revolution or Revolutionary France or Nazi Germany, getting yourself out of the country is one thing. Getting yourself out of the country with all of your wealth is quite another. Um, and so often, you know, if you look at history, it's very sad. Those people who kept all of their wealth with them, maybe they were buying gold for the right reason, which was that they feared some kind of economic or even social collapse down the pike. But by having all of their wealth with them, they now had to get everything out at the same time as they did. So the chances are they didn't get either. Right? They didn't get out alive and they didn't get their money in. I think if you have wealth in a foreign jurisdiction, you can get to it's a secure jurisdiction. So we offer London, New York, and Zurich. All have a strong, if imperfect, history of defending personal property rights. You can sell in London and buy immediately from Zurich, and vice versa with New York. However, you wish to trade, settlement is instant. It's yours straight away. You're not waiting on a broker's nominee account with two-day settlement. You know, you're, this is an immediate settlement inside the vault. So it just gives you that flexibility that if geopolitically things get uglier than they are and that you feel that there is a need to have property maybe outside your own borders, then you can take that action immediately. What about uh, the issue of, okay, so let's say, like we were talking earlier, you know, there, there's competitive currency devaluation going on that could conceivably lead to, you know, uh, exchange rate controls, mm -hmm. you know, or it also sets up the path of capital controls, currency devaluation getting dangerously to the point of hyperinflation or, or imposing, veering down that path. Um, do you think, is there, is there, is gold confiscation, does that play into uh, the rationale for having vault, gold in a, a number of jurisdictions? For instance, uh, let's say uh, the UK starts imposing some type of capital control, mm -hmm. will people in London benefit from having gold in Switzerland, for instance, or or how does that work? Or is it also even, let's say, for instance, I'm in the United States, I have some gold with bullion vault mm -hmm. in London and Switzerland. Um, am I at risk of the laws that are, any laws that could be passed in those jurisdictions as well, or, or how does that work? Well, I think, it, I think you're wise to be live to how those things might develop. It's very difficult to say how governments might act in the kind of crises that would lead them to enforce exchange controls. I think it's helpful, though, to look back at the most recent period in Western history when you had them, which was really the 1970s. So it's really the period, as we mentioned earlier, of Bretton Woods after the Second World War, where you had fixed exchange rates. And so to try and keep those pegs in place against the US dollar for most currencies, people brought down the shutters. The UK is a good example. So we come out, you know, having been the world leading empire going into World War One, our decline was pretty much nailed on then, the rise of America you know, took us in, you know, first early, very early part of the 20th, 20th century and then that accelerated as Britain began to decline because it was sclerotic and its industry was outdated, etc. Et what it meant after the Second World War was that an awful lot of uh, creditor countries were holding UK guilt, government bonds, that they no longer wanted. So the pound kind of went into free fall, really. I mean, it, and be, because it was an exchange control system, exchange rate system, it went down in stages, bang, 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 as they rechanged re the peg. To manage that, they basically tried to keep money inside the UK. 
What they didn't do was stop foreign money passing through. And the bullion market is a good example of this. London is still the world's center for bullion trading worldwide, and it certainly was in the 1970s. However, but when we joined the European Union, the European, uh, yeah, European Community as it was in 1973, that meant introducing sales tax in harmony with the rest of the European Union. The bullion market went straight to the government. You can't do this on gold and silver. This is nuts. Because the market will just flee. You can't say to our US customers or our Swiss users that they're now going to be paying value-added sales tax every time they buy gold and silver. So the compromise that was uh, that was developed was to say, well, fine, provided it stays inside the vault, and the vault is controlled by a major market member, okay, so a wholesale market member, then gold and silver do not attract VAT sales tax. VAT was taken off gold in 1999 anyway. Silver, it still applies, however. But bullion vault users, because we're members of the London Bullion Market Association, that means that the tax man in the UK recognizes us as main market participants. And because the gold, the silver, sorry, is inside uh, London Bullion Market approved storage, it's known as what's inside the black box for tax purposes. And it's only when you take possession of that, you withdraw it from that system, that the VAT is triggered. As I say, the whole aim of this is was in the 70s to enable foreign money to come in and out. So it's difficult to second guess you know, how these things might develop in the future. Again, that's one reason that we do offer a choice of jurisdictions. UK bullion vault users may find they want to bring their gold and have it in London instead. They might find that actually having it in Switzerland where it can't be confiscated anywhere near as easily as it could if they had it at home, where there you know, might be a more liquid active market going on if the UK does fall into you know, bringing down shutters entirely. It's just having that flexibility and being able to, you know, jump one way or the other. And I think, again, with regards to flexibility, people often look at gold and silver as being a one-shot solution. You know, there's a whole heap of trouble out there. We're all, we are all in this together. Um, gold and silver are going to get me out of that. I think that's only partially true. I think, you know, making that one decision is one step of the way. But I think you have to really this is a very complex situation that we're in. It may well become very fast-moving at one point in the future and that you're going to need to respond quickly as well. Sure. Um, one, uh, one other question I had is, um, so, you know, personally or in my uh, experience, you know, uh, the process I'll either write a check or do a uh, online bank transfer mm -hmm. to have uh, funds sent to my bullion vault account. I have tested withdrawing largely just to test the process and see how it works. Um, so I know for money laundering restrictions, you're not able to, you know, like for instance, I'm not able to withdraw and send it to my friend's account, you know, for, Correct. for Correct. probably a number of reasons, security, money laundering. Yeah. Um, now, what would happen if there's a uh, bank holiday in the U.S. or bank, they call it a holiday, bank shutdown in the U.S.? Um, yes. Am I sort of stuck or, or how is, how, how, can investors sort of expect to deal with that situation? Well, I mean, that's clearly a concern for anyone who has got property at arm's length. You know, whether you're in the New York vaults, if it, you know, it's you know, if that's where your gold is, you know, you'd still have problems if the banking system was shut to you. You'd still sure. Have realizing its value, so you know, whether it's overseas or, or whether it's domestic, you would affect the the problem that you'd have. One thing that we uh, we recently updated our terms and conditions, and one thing that we added there is to say that if for reasons beyond your control, beyond your reasonable control, you cannot affect banking transfers, then what you will be able to do is actually do withdrawals of physical bullion for 1%. So we'd actually you know, massively change the tariff on that for those exceptional circumstances only, so that our customers are in a position to actually realize the full value of their bullion in the absence of a banking network that they can use. Now, as I say, you know, those would be exceptional circumstances, um, but they are circumstances that I think people, you know, it's what William Vault always looks to do in all these matters. As, as a similar point, for instance, might be uh, what happens if we get annihilated, right? What happens if William Vault just <laughs> the face of the earth? Okay, now we know we don't like to think about that situation, right? But it could happen, and our customers, obviously, 43,000 people worldwide now, are right to worry about it, okay? Well, what we do every day is, you know the daily audit, which is where you can see your customer balance in public on the home page without logging in. 
and you see that under an anonymous nickname, so you know who you are, but nobody else does. We send a very deeply encrypted version of that every day to our auditors, our financial auditors, and also to VMAT, the vault operators. At the same time, the decryption key is with our lawyers, and their offices are in London and in New York. And in the event that Bullion Vault ceases operation and no administrator is appointed by a UK court, let's imagine because the UK courts don't exist either anymore, then the process is that the key is passed first to our auditors, and they are based 200 miles away from London, and then they can unlock that, and that will give them contact details for all of our customers, so that they can then get in touch, and they can also see, as of that day's daily audit, who's holding what. So in terms of the assets that are there, they can then begin to arrange the distribution of that. The kind of situation that, you know, it's you don't really want to think about. It's one of those things where people say, well, how would this work and how would that work? But I think what it demonstrates is that, you know, Bullion Bolt is committed to making sure our customers can realize the full value and get access to their property in as wide a range of circumstances as we can allow for. Sure, and uh, w one other thing that, you know, this conversation just reminded me of that I wanted to mention in this video for, for all those who are watching is I've you know when you're when you've got more or if you're putting a somewhat significant sum of your capital your net wealth uh, in bullion vault or, or in gold storage services in general um, inheritance becomes an issue you know obviously I hope to live a long time um, but I did with bullion vault I, I inquired by email about this before and I was told to uh, upload sort of a I forget the official term for it but some type of letter saying yeah. Hey, in case something happens, let these people do whatever they need. Um, could you just uh, sort of elaborate on that? Well, that's basically just to make sure that we have got instructions from you for the in the event of your death. Um, it's not dissimilar to you know what happens in the event of bullion vault annihilation. You know right. what, happens, what happens to all this stuff if you're no longer there? Okay, where is it to go? Who are we, who are we to expect to hear from? Who should we contact, etc.? I mean, obviously, you know. Good, um, we have customers, you know, we, we do have you know, uh, death cases to deal with. Um, basically, there's a very solid system in place for that internationally, really, for recognizing cross border assets um, in terms of, you know, establishing that yes, this person is really dead, yes, this person is really responsible for what happens to their estate afterwards. By uploading that declaration of intent, what you're basically doing is just giving us that extra bit of information so that we can kickstart that. So we can basically, you know, we know who to expect to hear from in the event of your death, etc. So that we can then basically move that process along with timely and smoothly. Sure. Um, well, I think that's uh, that's about it in terms of the questions I had. A great discussion on you know the gold market, the bullion vault services. Um, thanks a lot for joining us, Adrian. Uh, for anyone who wants to learn more. The website is, of course, bullionvault.com. We'll have links below this video as well. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us, Adrian. It's been great fun. Thanks very much, Simon. Sure. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye now.